Hello, I'm Sue Johns and uh, this is my contribution uh, towards a virtual Dodo Modern Poets, uh, which is coming to you um, from Mitcham, from my living room here in Mitcham, uh, with top technology, um, a phone propped up on the back of a chair. So I'm going to read half a dozen poems for you and I'm going to start with three from my pamphlet, Rented. Uh, there are three poems in here that are all about the same character. Uh, a woman called Promise, who is a Nigerian prostitute working in London. And this is called Watching Promise. Watching Promise across the square from under the tabby nets. It seems a client has left her a gift. My guess is a filthy fingernail got married to her oily hip and fathered some pus just out of reach because she's using some dirty dance moves to squeeze it. Promise knows this isn't like the hand jobs we give off the curb, ending in a heavy spurt. This is a wound that'll spread and come back weeping across an angry border. It reminds me of those new girls when they stray into a foreign postcode. Promise needs to put on the slippers that make her look free again, though she's formidable in heels, and pay a visit to the prissy chemist, who'll be relieved not to be asked for morning afters or a cream for crabs, though she'll still disperse that look she reserves for an entire continent, watching Promise bounce her box braids out of there with a crash and the doorbell pinging. This is our healing time. My friend rubs antiseptic into the wet of her back fat as the square takes a communal draw to the lungs. Watching Promise unlock her milky windows to lie with her legs wide open and let in some air. And this one is set in, in London, probably about sort of late 40s, early 50s. And it's called The Dancer's Choice. She was plies and poses, applause and Tchaikovsky, par de chat, sleeping beauty. Chocolates and bouquets outside the opera house, always on point for gentlemen callers. Post-war chic, Piccadilly, Mayfair, but one small slip and something's missing. Counting the weeks, squeezed in a costume, par de cheval, sleeping beauty. She knows someone, who knows someone, not telling anyone getting it fixed. But inside Aurora, another ballerina is already cast as the lilac fairy. Her steps are perfect, PK, PK. Aurora doubles over, away from the bar, arabesque and wretch. With the dilation, they'll expose the little dancer, cauterizing her pirouette. Down in the basement is the shell-shocked assistant, a perfectly recruited victim of the trenches. He'll never speak of the baby protégé, writhing in the gore, gauzed in lavender, right on cue, rising from the sluices, leaving the sink with a grand jeté. And the final one from here, um, is set in South Africa. Um, South Africa having a much, much worse uh, lockdown than us at the moment um, because they've banned um, outside exercise and alcohol. Uh, but this came out of a bushwalk in South Africa where I learned about something called hormonal sentience, which is how trees communicate with each other, um, which is quite amazing. Hormonal sentience. Trees are telling tales, murmuring to the neighbours in ethylene. 
to fill their leaves with tannin, make themselves distasteful to hungry browsers. Trees speak, as they did when man's mimicry was all but animal, in the days of stone shapes and fire miracles, when language rolled in with the wheel. Mapani trees added their tongue to the clicking consonants of Holzan, the long Dutch vowels, when the first ship anchored at the Cape and unloaded its cargo of dubious futures. Acacia trees wept with the abolitionists, mused on the passing mules and wagons, the death of each warrior, every red-coated column, and debated the true price of gold. Trees in yellow-flowered frocks, gossiped and prayed each summer long, sang anthems, cast their ballots in the breeze, as freedom was isolated in the time of monochrome. Trees with rebel pheromones collude at sunrise, when shots ring from the mines, and each thrumming shanty surrenders its contents to the needs of the sparkling towns. This next poem um, is inspired by my uh, day job, uh, which is in a department store, now closed of course. Um, it's actually about certain things that I observed there around Christmas time, but it's called The Shop Assistant's Guide to Faith. Denied his face, his forehead touching the floor, his compact kneeling body separating me from lunch in the locker that evidently faces Mecca. A contract cleaner, unaware of the prayer facilities, his prayer map not the intricate design of village weavers, but self-assembly flooring intended for the latest promotion unsure of the weight, unhappy to straddle this stoic, I lean on tiptoe, turn the key. My return finds flooring neatly stacked, showing no sign of religious significance. In the Christmas department, the Magi are in abeyance. A tearful housewife finds an absence of nativity sets. I recall the assortment of previous years, how out of hours the shepherds and stable animals were rearranged into interesting positions. There was a 20% reduction for a missing king, but when the baby Jesus went missing, there was no suitable markdown. Still, he hadn't helped with the lottery when the wooden advent calendar fell to the floor and six windows stayed shut, we gambled and lost. Some have removed themselves from this paucity of faith, are reunited with their God in dusty corners. Others wander amongst the festive themes from Nordic to glamorous, still clinging to their own pocket Christ. So um, all the th things that are happening with the lockdown, uh, everyone's trips have been cancelled. I'm supposed to be going down to Cornwall in two or three weeks because I can't go. Um, and that reminds me a bit of um, a few years ago, uh, 2014 it was in fact, when uh, the dreadful storms cut off the um, railway link uh, to Cornwall. So this is a poem about that and a bit of a love story and it's called Wet Paint. I want to capture the storm in oils, Geoffrey, retired seaman and artist. Oh no, no genie, model student and love interest, who brings him heavy cake, still warm in the tin. He has a vision of her, washed up at Lubar, bloated and pale with one shoe and no knickers. Tis drains us, my love, they've lifted the boats, I must insist you stick to still life until this blows over. At the mount, 
it's a black flag day. The harbour master curses the elements that have crushed the work of giants. A crushed giant finishes his dinner at the Newlin mission. It boards up its eyes as he heads for the sortie. Nets a shoal of rum and shrubs and as a wash as the bulks takes on Paul Hill at the mercy of the weather. Down road, they're watching Dawlish on the news, joking that the damage should have happened further down, settling for semi-isolation, albeit with Devonians, agreeing that climate change is all the fault of foreigners and channel hopping for anything on Nigel Farage. As the jet stream weakens and the rain rides up country, the painters of Port Leven are easeled from the terraces. Capture what you can name from memory, ladies, then frame it for your own protection. Ultramarine for a missing crabber, a crimson boy for focus. But I've so many beaches and harbours, Geoffrey. Can we not master the waters beyond? If there's two things in life, I fear, Jeannie. Tis shop-bought bacon and an artist too far out at sea. And for my final poem, I'm going to do one that's um, literally a, a draft. Um, but I thought I'd finish with this as it's a little bit, little bit topical. And it's called Plat de Jour. I am cooking corn pie with Marmite gravy. In Manadu, a bat in a curry looks less appalling than the ones in Samoon Market. Too much food, too little time. My strawberries have all gone mouldy. At the river, a giant carp and ducks compete for a piece of carrot cake. In Wuhan, an appalled pangolin curls into a ball. Despite a lack of flour and eggs, Waitrose still has stem ginger and buttermilk. Despite many families eating leaves, in Tahiz, the rice leaves with the soldiers. My neighbours are frying bacon. Two ladybirds attempt to dine on my stairs. Stupid insects go outside and devour some aphids and leave the Axminster to the petulant moths. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, oh, except to say that I did, in fact, have one uh, actual audience member, Dave. Uh, this is my trusty steed, Dave. So goodbye from me and uh, goodbye from Dave. <laughs>